Hi, this is Bob Ross, CEO and Master Electrician of Jefferson Electric. Today we're installing a basement receptacle circuit start to finish. Now this project applies to any basement receptacle that you might install for any type of appliance. Washer, dryer, fridge, freezer, sump pump, grinder pump, general use or other types of appliances. When are you going to want a dedicated circuit? Well, if you've got a power hungry device, you're probably going to want a dedicated circuit. Or if the receptacle failure or tripping loss of power could be catastrophic, such as in the case of a sump pump for your basement, you're probably going to want a dedicated circuit in that case as well. Let me walk you through the quick overview of the project from electrical panel, dedicated circuit, out of the top of the panel, across the ceiling, fished through a joist cavity here, down to our completed water softener receptacle there. Now let's take a quick look at the materials required to execute this project. The tools and materials that I'm going to be using for this job include a driver and a drill, a four inch square metal box with a grounding screw, a seven cubic inch raised decora cover for my four inch box, GFCI receptacle, two minis for my conduit supports, a box connector, a bushing for the end of my conduit, a Romex connector for termination in my panel, my basic non-metal hammer, staples for securing the wire, screws for supporting my box and conduit, folding rule, old trusty, and a torpedo level for straightening up my conduit and box, basic wire zip ties for securing my wire through this environment, a carbide hole saw because I'm going to be drilling through plaster and I don't want to put wear and tear on my bimetal hole saws, fish sticks for overcoming one of the obstacles, a nice O-Lite, love this thing, my digital plug-in tester to verify the work when complete, shop vac, grandma's old stool because I'm working in the basement and I only need about a foot of extra elevation, and of course my wire and basic electrical hand tools. I'm actually, for my wire, I'm also using this little caddy, and that caddy is gonna allow that wire to just spool off nice and straight and smoothly so that it doesn't bind and catch through the obstacles that I'll encounter in the ceiling. I want that just to be a straight run of smooth wire. Let's start by pulling some wire between our destinations. I've got the main electrical panel here, and uh, I'm gonna slip this wire right up over this two by four so I've got a nice tight edge because there'll be some resistance there. I could pull it up and over this ceiling support, but I'm afraid that by the time I actually pull that wire through, it's gonna come loose. So find something a little bit more rigid to be your anchor point. But that caddy, it should pull pretty smooth. Might need to feed it. I don't wanna abrade the wire during installation. That's not gonna serve any good purposes. Okay, I definitely have lots of obstacles up here and I've got a few things that I'm seeing that uh, I've inherited that I don't like. There's a gas line here and this Romex wire is almost pinned between the plaster ceiling and the gas line. There's just no separation. I tried to rock and rotate this gas line a little bit to see if there was, it was loose, but no, that's not the case. So I'm gonna chart a new path through here, avoiding the gas lines and at least not be contributing to that code violation. I like to uh, get an overall length on my wires. So I'm pulling it off the caddy. So there's the main panel. We're coming across the drop ceiling here. I'm gonna cut through a joist bay. I'm gonna drop the outlet right here by the water softener. Well, that's pretty close. I'm not gonna cut it until it's terminated on this end, and then I'll cut it to length with just a little bit of slack to spare once I'm confident that the it's just right. These drop ceilings can be real sharp, and they'll literally just slice your wire if you let them. So be cautious, of, uh, especially at the corners where the pieces come together and they've been cut. 
either factory or field. Assembling my fish sticks here. This is where my, my wiring chase is. The guy who installed the water softener for me, he's got his um, discharge line through this joist cavity. So I know if he did it, I could probably do the same. So I've got this nifty little wine cellar area here where the water softener is located, and this bulkhead is gonna be my friend. I'm gonna drill a pilot hole before setting up my larger hole saw, just to make sure that I'm in the clear. I really don't care where that outlet is located on this wall, probably just more or less end up right here, so it's real convenient. Sounds to be all hollow up there. So I'm gonna find a, the approximate center of my conduit and go for it. Okay, so I think I found the support for this bulkhead because I definitely didn't just go through three quarters inch of material. There's more than that. But uh, I'm not averse. I'm not averse to that at all. Here it goes. Okay, that's far enough because my Romex is gonna be able to offset. So I'm gonna pop out the slug that's left and I'm in the bulkhead. That's it, that's all I need. I think that's the only hole I'm gonna to have to drill. Now that I have that hole on the other side, I'm gonna send my fish stick through as opposed to reversing the operation and risking causing damage to my fish sticks if I should happen to hit it. In this situation, I'm using 12 gauge wire and a 20 amp circuit. This is a dedicated circuit, not because the water softener is such a heavy load, but because I want room for expansion. I'm gonna need more power down here and it's pretty limited currently. So uh, I could service uh, all of this with a 15 amp circuit easily, but for a couple extra cents and no extra time, I'm just gonna go ahead and plan for the future. I'm using a GFCI receptacle, not because uh, really any specific reason that's a little bit above and beyond what I need. An unfinished basement, you see by code, is considered a wet location. A finished basement is not considered a wet location. And really the primary definition revolves around flooring. If it's a bare concrete floor, it's probably considered by an inspector and definition, an unfinished basement. But I actually have linoleum and laminate plank down here. So that's my justification and the fact that I've been here for two years and have never seen water on the floor, that this is a finished basement. So the GFCI protection is a little bit above and beyond, but I love GFCI protection. I'm gonna spend an extra 15, 20 bucks on that above a standard outlet. In my mind, worth it. Let's fish across the ceiling here. We've got a lot of water piping to contend with. So I'm gonna choose my route carefully to try to minimize Oh, and I got a gas line too. Those gas lines are everywhere. I think I'm going right there. So fish stick as opposed to fish tape because I've got a little bit of a push to get across the ceiling. These are pretty flexible fish sticks, um, but they're gonna push in a more true, more straight, more predictable manner as opposed to that fish tape that's gonna flop around. And so I wanna have more control in this equation. You know, if I'm a DIYer and I'm working on uh, building up my tooling base, I'm probably going to start with a little tube of fish sticks because I think you'll have um, a little bit more success, but add a fish tape to it, even a 25 footer, as soon as the opportunity allows. So we've just sent the fish stick from that opening across the ceiling, about six feet, and I've got an opening here that was created when this water softener was installed. It's through the plaster and lath ceiling. You can see the metal lath. There's no wooden lath in this house and that textured plaster. So my hope is that the fish sticks are in a, this approximate location right now. I can find it and use this as a relay point to fish down inside my bulkhead to this hole that we drilled right here for a receptacle placement on this wall. Let's see what we find without lacerating my arm on this metal lath. Oh, there it is. Back up the truck, we're right there. We are right there. All right, so I'm too far in, I'm backing it up. Backing up that fish stick. Oh no, and I'm not joking about that laceration risk. Man, that metal lab is, it can be brutal, brutal. All right, I'm at a fish stick joint, so I'm gonna spin it apart here, because it is, there's, there's some resistance up there, there's. 
There's two, two or three fish sticks. And uh, here comes the rest. About 25 feet of wire length for this whole job. Going from one room in the basement to the next. Ooh, it's hung up. I don't know what it's caught on. I'm gonna turn to the right to avoid undoing any of the couplings on my fish sticks. There it comes. There it is. It's pulling smoothly. I don't wanna pull real hard. I definitely don't wanna yank. That Romex wire is sensitive and I wanna get this install done without causing damage to the outer jacket. If I do cause the jacket substantial damage where it's cut through, I'm gonna to have to splice it at that location. Oh, I'm stuck again. Made progress, but... Oh, I see. Oh, it's a tight little hole. Plumbing barely fits through here. So that's a question that's asked periodically. What kind of separation and proximity do plumbing and electric need to have with each other? And the answer is they can share holes, in our jurisdiction at least, check with your inspector. They can share holes, they can share stud bays and framing cavities, but the one place they can't share is at the electrical panel. At any piece of major electrical equipment, plumbing is not allowed because there is open electrical there it is and uh, that constitutes a code violation even for plumbing to be anywhere in that main working space of the panel all right i'm probably going to want about another two feet and almost there again don't pull too hard go back feed it through check anywhere it might be kinked wrapped around the drop ceiling or a pipe and just ease it through ease it through all right, now it's time for uh, fish phase number two. I'm gonna take my three hooks. I, I, I almost always, almost always, gonna fish from the smaller hole to the bigger hole. So up here, I've got about a half a square foot. Down here, I've got a, about a one inch hole. And there's some blockage from the framing that I anticipated on this bulkhead. So what I'm gonna do is check how these ends marry up. I've got a male end there. So through this hole, I'm gonna go ahead and send up the female end and try to get it to pop out here. And then I'll couple them together and slide it back through. You can use hooks, um, loops, any kind of apparatus that these fish sticks are equipped with, or you can just tape them together. I'm gonna do this just because it's gonna be a, a secure connection that is simple. Ooh, definitely hitting obstructions. One of the tricks of becoming proficient at fishing electrical lines is understanding the framing, the rough framing. Um, when you spend some time looking at how homes of different ages are framed and you understand what you can expect with bulkheads and archways and different kinds of framing configurations, then you can almost start to feel with the end of the fish stick or fish tape what's happening inside the wall and it becomes an intelligent process as opposed to an absolutely infuriating waste of time. Now one thing I don't know is this bulkhead could have been added after the ceiling. In fact, it's probably a safe guess. So I might not have access into the joist bay that's above the plaster. I might be restricted inside this bulkhead. Feeling like a dead end. All right, <clears throat> let's do this. I'm gonna feel up on top of uh, this bulkhead. Uh, ouch, ouch, ouch. Oh, it's too tight. Create some space here. Peel back all these sharp metal edges. Okay, I think 
if we can get that to fit. Oh, ouch. Hmm. Yep, it's solid. Yikes! Ouch! Easy! Woo! Okay. What I'm going to have to do here is I, I did detect some mechanicals that are coming across here. I think they're two old water lines. They're galvanized water lines. I don't think any of those are active. Um, but I'm still going to exercise some caution. Try to put an extension bit on the end of my drill that's going to extend my reach and I'm going to drill up through the existing hole and up through the ceiling. Mm. It's kind of a long shot. It's definitely added a layer of complexity to the project. Okay, so I'm about to use the mother of all drills. Woo but uh, if you don't have the mother of all drills, what you could consider is cutting in an electrical access panel, like a plumbing access panel. But we call them electrical access panels. They are found in the plumbing aisle at your home store. But you can get a six by six, an eight by eight, a 14 by 14, cut that in and then put it up as a permanently accessible yet finished appearance. Wouldn't look good on the brown, but you can paint them. They come in white typically, but you can paint them. You could wallpaper over them. But here's the scoop. You could also use an extension bit on your drill. And you can pick up a modest extension bit for 10, 12 bucks on Amazon, link in the description. What I'm gonna do is, I know I'm going through plaster and lath and I happen to be working on another project, so I had an extension cord and this big drill sitting right there on the floor. Heck, why not? There's one more obstacle going on here though. The joist bay is a 14 and a half edge to edge joist bay and it's about right here on the ceiling. So when I drill through, I'm not gonna be able to get the right angle to enter into the joist bay of choice. I'm gonna be in the next bay over. So effectively, I've got a series of challenges here that I don't honestly yet know if I'm gonna be able to overcome. I've got this tiny hole to fish through with a framing obstacle. I've got, uh, I'm gonna punch a small hole about three quarter size through into the next joist bait. That's still the wrong joist bait. That's a series of two small holes. And then I've gotta get over potentially right here into the other. What I'm saying is I'm gonna have three holes to fish through. One is easy. Two is challenging, three is a prayer. So, but we'll have fun while we're doing it. Why not? I might need to remove more of this ledger board material. I am gonna go at an angle in order to send my fish tape towards the desired source, because if I go straight up, I'm gonna hit and then I'm not gonna be able to make a 90 degree turn. I wanna smooth that edge to maybe even a 45. So the fish tape, fish stick, when it hits, it naturally wants to follow and go that direction. See what happens. I'm not real worried about the cosmetics of this space, if you couldn't tell. So we're just gonna have some fun with it. All right, I drilled like three holes. It's gonna be easier to hit one of them. So when you're drilling blind like that, don't worry, because wearing doesn't help. But <laughs> you should understand that you, you, you might hit something and cause some pretty substantial peripheral damages to where you've got to cut out a large section of finished materials and make a very time consuming repair. Um, that being said, I do have a couple vantage points into this space and I don't see anything critical that's entering or exiting that space. And I know that above this room, it's, uh, it's not like a kitchen or bathroom, something that's complex with plumbing. I think it's a, a, just gonna be a void in a very sim simple space. So my, my worry factor is low, my risk factor appears to be low. Let's see what we can do. <clears throat> So now getting my drill up between these water lines to go through the joist into the next joist cavity. Mm, it's just all, all too tight. It is all too tight. I'll reduce the speed. Give my drill a break. Mm. 
Got in there pretty good, pretty deep. Now I'm gonna remove the, the slug, that bit of material that is left behind. Oh, and you're using a hole saw. Get that out of there, almost through. This is a nice new hole saw. Cuts smoothly. All right, I'm through. Woo, it's getting, getting dicey. So I've got a shepherd's hook on the end of my fish sticks. I've got enough fish sticks assembled that I can feed through the bulkhead and come out the ceiling without losing it on each end. I want it to be long enough. So I'm gonna try to follow the same angle as my drill did. And I think I'm through. I think I'm through the ceiling. And come on. What I'm trying to do is get it to turn that direction. And it is. Oh, okay. Progress. Now, part of the issue is <clears throat> it's such a tight hole that my hole through the joist, if you can picture it, my hole through the joist is drilled low. This fish stick is gonna hit the floor above and follow high. So I'm not gonna be, I'm probably gonna have six or more inches of separation between my hole and where the fish stick lies. So that's really gonna be the point at which the challenge occurs. out recalibrate see where I am that didn't feel right okay I'm in this fishing loop a little differently than what it how it was intended but I think it'll serve my purposes here I'm gonna tape that edge and I want I don't want that because I'll get caught when I'm trying to pull it out of the hole so I'm gonna tape that down nice and smoothly and I'm gonna use this the fishing loop to try to catch the end of the other fish tape fish stick fish stick here, do I? Or fish tape, fish tape, tape. Uh, okay, so I did get the fish sticks through there. Not easy, did happen. And now I just got it all taped up, nice and smooth edges. Go slow, don't wanna lose your fish. Don't wanna lose your fish at all. Too much time and effort in a fish to lose it. Just wiggle, every time you get stuck, back it up a bit, wiggle. Now you may notice that I took a slightly different route. I actually reached over the top of the bulkhead, busted a hole through, folded the edges of the metal back, and um, then used the bulkhead to transfer over to my hole. So slightly different approach, uh, but very necessary. That other way was crazy, but I got to show you the mother of all drills. We have a cordless version of that. A couple of them and they're just beautiful. Oh. SDS, Max, Spline Shank, a couple different ones. Okay, there it is. I got plenty of wire. We've got a little bit of loop de loop de do. Not really loop de do, just a little bit of slack. Let's get this thing terminated inside the conduit and the box. Almost there. Half inch knockout, three quarter inch fitting. So this is where I dig into my parts stuff box and recalibrate a little bit. I'm gonna use, I'm gonna put that on the bottom because I'm gonna put a, a knockout in that and I'm gonna knock out three quarter inch here. So if you make a blooper, that's a, 
either dig into your parts stuff box or make a run to the hardware store, but we can't have open knockouts in boxes. You do have to close them up. So that's the one I'm looking for. Always tool tight. I spin my set screw around so it's facing straight out, just at that little tidbit of professionalism. Let's go mount a box. All right, I didn't have a half inch KO closer. So I used two fender washers, a through bolt, a lock nut, a lock washer, and a nut to close that up. So that's gonna be equivalent or better restoring the, uh, the housing, in my enclosure here. <clears throat> All right, we're cutting our conduit down. This is the one piece of material I did not introduce to you in the opener because it was lying on the floor and I forgot about it. And this blade, my friends, is officially trash. <laughs> that was terrible. All right, they, uh, they do make conduit reamers. I've always just used my pliers to spin around. That just works so, so well. If it doesn't cut your finger, it's not gonna cut the wire. That's a factory inch, I don't have to ream it. But uh, all, all cut ends should be reamed. There's no question about it. It's just a question of how you do it. It's up to you. If you don't do a lot of conduit work, I suggest using my method. If you do a lot of conduit work, I suggest that you buy a conduit reamer. This is a tap-on bushing. This tap-on bushing is gonna smooth, smooth that edge. It's got just a sixteenth of an inch profile all the way around, maybe thirty second, and that allows smooth wire entry so that it never gets cut over that metal edge. One of the things that gets a lot of debate is whether Romex cable can be installed inside of conduit. The answer in our jurisdiction by our inspector's enforcement interpretation is yes, as long as it's not a wet location conduit, and this is not. This is an incomplete conduit system that's strictly for the purpose of supporting and protecting the Romex cable. Therefore, not only can Romex be installed in the conduit, but I don't have to consider wire fill, and because I only have two current carrying conductors, the hot and the neutral, I don't have to consider D-rates either. Make sure you know your local codes before embarking on this little adventure. If we get 200 likes on this video, what we'll do is we will create a dedicated video on each one of these topics to further explain them so that you can master the subject matter. Now let's terminate our receptacle here. I've got too much conductor. I'm gonna cut it back. I really want about nine inches. That's plenty. I've only got a line side to my GFCI, no load side. That means incoming, no outgoing. And oh, whoop, there we go. I am gonna go ahead and break off, uh, pull out my, whew, my screws, because that's not how this GFCI is gonna mount. Give a quick trial fit here. Break off my ears. Easy, I don't want to damage the yoke. And this is just a, a, an intended factory modification across scored lines to allow this GFCI to mount in this situation. So we've got our GFCI wired, hot, neutral, ground on the line side. You gotta get all of that right. You gotta keep neutral and ground separated or this GFCI will not reset. We're using Robertson screws here, which I really appreciate. Unfortunately, Robertson lost to Phillips in the bid for Henry Ford's business uh, back uh, almost 100 years ago. And uh, shame, shame, shame. Love the Robertson. Henry Ford determined he could save two hours on the assembling, assembling a car by using Robertson screws because they centered the, the tooling in the fastener, unlike the flathead. And that was the era, era where flathead was king. And uh, unfortunately, Phillips took over. So we are using um, the supplied parts with this cover plate. There's locking nuts on the back side of these screws, really tight, secure connection. I'm gonna fold these wires into the box and just give it one full rotation here. Uh, just make sure that that ground wire does not come in contact with hot or neutral. There it is. And then these screws are supplied with the box. You may have noticed. It's 
it's easy in the midst of it all to leave something un untightened, so I always come back through after the last fastener is snug and just check, check, maybe something stripped out. You never know. All is well. We're ready to ch support the cable, terminate at the panel, energize the system, and test functionality. Here we go, stapling the wire. The one thing I'm gonna add to my little task here is I'm gonna snip off the zip ties that secure this Romex to the gas line. I'm gonna put in staples here, and because it's such a tight spot, I'm actually gonna use zip ties through my plastic staples in order to secure this wire. All right, it's time to terminate the wire in the panel. Here it is, I'm gonna make sure I have just a little bit of extra up there. I did at one point zip tie this, uh, the wire to the conduit, but as long as the electrical system is secured by listed supports to the electrical system, that's fine. It's, which, when you get into trouble is when you start supporting the electrical system off of the plumbing system, the plumbing system off of the gas piping system, and you start crossing systems, don't do it. But one system secured and supported by a listed anchor support fastener to the same system, that's okay. Typically you won't get dinged for that. That's what I've done at one point here. All right, I'm gonna pull it back here a little bit. If you are the least bit lacking in confidence or strong in safety, shut off the power. As is often the case, I have a fully occupied home here. I'm just gonna go slow, take my time, but the panel is live. One of the things to watch out for is don't let that ground wire bounce back and contact the terminals. So my, my routine is to land ground, neutral, and hot. In this case, ground and neutral are going to the same place. I'm gonna have a dedicated terminal for my neutral. I'm not gonna share terminals. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna sleeve it back here behind all these other conductors. That's what I want right there. Easy, easy. And I'm gonna use my back, I don't, you may not be able to tell, but this ground and neutral bar is forward and this one's back. If I fill this one up first, I'm gonna have a heck of a hard time slipping back in there and landing here. So I wanna fill the further back terminal bar first and then the other terminal bar. So I'm gonna bend my conductors, how I want them to lie inside the panel. Watch for bouncing, woo! It is tight. Use the strop, proper strip gauge so you don't damage the conductor in attempting to strip it back. And then the, and it's not hazardous to touch a neutral bar. However, if there's a loose connection on the neutral bar, you can get arcing and you could become the current path. Here's my available breakers. I've got two spares right there. Hold this side again so it doesn't bounce. Ooh. You may notice <clears throat> this right here does impinge on working space. I did not put this closet up here. Um, but I'm not one of the guys who just comes in here and just starts ripping everything out. I'd like to have a plan and be prepared to execute on that plan first. This is the mudroom, so I'm gonna, my kids spend a decent amount of time in here getting ready and I'd just rather have things closed up and out of sight, out of the way. Now before I energize this circuit, um, it's fully routed, fully supported, fully secured and terminated. But I'm gonna pull out the torque screwdriver, snug this down, and then energize. All right, so these terminals down here are gonna tighten down to 10 inch pounds and the breaker to 36. The nameplate inside the panel specifies the neutral and ground terminals, and then on the breaker itself is where the specs are for that. So 10 inch pounds, we're there, and it's not a lot there. Transition to our straight blade bit for the breaker. This is a non-electrically insulated torque wrench. So the breaker has to be in the off position. 36 inch pounds. 
That's quite a bit of force. There it is. All right, we're ready to throw the switch. Boom, live, let's go test it. A three-prong tester is really the best way to test this. Most of the devices nowadays are gonna be tamper resistant, so you're gonna to struggle to use a hot stick itself or just the prongs of your multimeter. So I'm really a huge fan of this Klein plug-in tester with the digital readout. The receptacle is naturally in the faulted position. You can see that red light. I'm gonna push reset, plug in. I've got 124 volts. The readout says correct. The light is green, that means it's been wired properly. I'm gonna push test. GFCI trips, voltage drops to zero. Actually 0 0.01, that's effectively zero. Don't let that fool you. I reset, resumes to 124, correct with a green light. We're good to go. This is actually really gratifying because this little job has been on my personal bucket list for over 12 months. <laughs> I've been running off an extension cord through a doorway. How embarrassing is that? <sighs> Quick metrics on this project. You know, my material cost was pretty low, under 100 bucks. Um, most of that is actually in the breaker and the GFCI. Breaker like this is gonna cost about $30. GFCI could be close to that for a tamper resistant, wet, weather resistant GFCI. If you're gonna hire it out, because you're getting into the panel and you're running a dedicated circuit, if that's the situation you're in, you could easily be north of 600 bucks. If you find a hungry contractor who's a little low on work, you might whittle that baby down to four or 500. Um, but I also wouldn't be surprised if in your area you're playing, paying closer to $1,000 for this project professionally sourced out. Subscribe to Electric Pro Academy for real skills to make real money.